Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. All right, we're going to kick things off here uh, with talking today all about the lower back and the lumbar spine, but also really just kind of trying to get the you know higher level stuff out of the way in one lecture so we can dig right into the fun stuff. The people who requested this weekend and wanted to learn from me about this, they said, hey, I love the dorky stuff. I love the concepts, but I want to know exactly what you're doing right now for back pain, for knee pain, for hip pain, for whatever. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to kind of get through the boring stuff here. I'm going to outline these phases, these five phases of rehab that I really use for not only lumbar spine stuff, but the next two days worth of knee, hip, ankle, whatever, shoulder. And I really want to kind of get this lecture up and out of the way so we can really go right to the, the most possible value, which is that people said, what exercises are you using? Show me how you treat. If I was sitting in you with the clinic for a couple days, what would I watch you do and how would you help gymnast for all sorts of injuries? So that's what I made this weekend about. I made it a little bit less about the dorky references and all the geeky stuff and diving into research and breaking down the methods. And I've just included all the references into a giant PDF at the end. So if you want to go and find all the reasons why I'm doing it, why I do certain exercises, that's great. And I have many other things we've put online that have really in-depth covered of those research, but I'm trying to deliver what people said they wanted, which was, hey, just show me the clinical stuff. Just tell me what you're doing and how you're how you're treating people to get them better. So that is what we were doing. And then everything um, that we did for this weekend, again, per request, we are recording the lectures as you're seeing here, and I'm uploading those into the back end of our website. And you can go in and you can then, you know, ask uh, questions, follow up, or you can rewatch the lectures, you can look at the handouts. But people said it was much more helpful when we recorded lectures and put them up live so that I could be available in the chat to clarify things and not just wait to the end, rush through a Q&A session and then move on to the next lecture. I really want to make sure that people are getting value from me, which is answering their questions and clarifying things as we go and then we'll take some questions at the end. But I don't want people to feel like we are you know, skipping over their questions. And so we're recording this stuff putting it up now live and then we're also going to put it up in teachable after so you can go back and you have lifetime access to all 15 lectures all the q a's all the handouts whatever you possibly need my goal is to just deliver as much possible help as, as i can in these three days to really get people to feel comfortable working in the clinic whether they're very experienced with gymnastics and they just want to hear some quick tips that i use or they're a brand new grad who's coming out of school and they want to work with gymnastics but they're terrified so that is really the hope it's all clinical let's get the the high level stuff out of the way in this one lecture and then from there, we'll move on to all the really good uh, evaluation stuff, the treatment stuff. Okay. My personal approach, uh, I've learned from Mike and Lenny, who are my mentors and many other people, that I do not want to swear by one system. I, I have fortunately studied a lot of different systems in the, in the PT world. It's like the SFMA. It's the uh, FMS that goes along with that. It's the McKenzie system. It's the, uh, you know, the, the pain science model. It's the McGill method. You know, there's so many things, PRI. There are so many things that you could use to treat someone for different injuries. And I, rather than be dogmatic about one, I'd rather really go deep and learn all that I can about that system and then kind of pull my head out of the, out of the well a little bit and, and take different exercises or different approaches based on the person in front of me. That's my, that's what I, found really useful is read a lot of research, take a lot of courses, combine that with my clinical experience of a lot of, you know, gymnasts that I've seen, particularly with back pain. I've treated like a thousand people for back pain for gymnasts and many other athletes and then say, okay, what's the person in front of me need? What, what can I do to help them as much as possible? So whatever you've learned from, uh, just do the best with the tools that you have, right? And so I want to make sure that people feel as though they are using evidence and they're using research to their advantage, but they are not just saying like, well, there's no double standard gold randomized trial for this exercise versus that exercise, so I'm not going to do that. And just because, you know, this doesn't work or this doesn't say it has evidence or this is like, you know, not been studied yet, I'm not going to do it. Because I think you start to get into a really challenging position where you're, you're really uh, paralyzed by the evidence instead of using it to your advantage. So that is just my personal approach. And again, this weekend is, is really people asked me to share my personal approach based on what I found successful. And so that's what we're going to do is we're going to share what I think is useful instead of debating all of the dorky stuff. All right. These are my main focuses for all five phases uh, at a global level, but also for just how I treat people. I'm very, very big on interdisciplinary care. I constantly work with uh, other surgeons or doctors, PTs, ATs, chiro, nutrition, mental health, strength and conditioning coaches. I really believe that the best level of care combines all these people. So I'm constantly communicating with everybody. I also really believe in, in really listening to the person and trying to understand where they've been. Okay. I unfortunately see people who have maybe worked with other providers that don't really understand gymnastics 
gymnastics and they rush them along in the rehab process. They go back to gymnastics without a great plan and then they come back to me frustrated. So I want to hear what they've been through, what has worked, what has not worked, combine that with what I see in front of me and then say, what are your goals? Where are you in season? What type of gymnastics do you do? Do you not want to compete? Do you want to compete? Is it adult gymnastics? Is it youth? I really want to just understand where someone is coming from. Okay. And from there, I'm trying to educate the person about what is going on. I always make this analogy with people in the um, you know clinic that if I went to the mechanic and I know nothing about mechanics like really well at all, if I went to the mechanic and I said like, hey, my engine light is on and it's like sputtering and it like didn't really work when I turned it over this morning. If if he or she gave me this complex mechanical engineering, you know, well the reverse, you know, flap thing of this and the oil intake, you know, and they started just going crazy on terminology, I'd be like, yo, listen. I just want to drive my car and not have it blow up, right? And I think sometimes as, as well-intentioned are we as we are in the medical field, we take all these courses, we learn all these research things, and some people do want to learn the geeky stuff, but most people don't. They want to have a basic understanding of why something is, in, is not working or why something hurts or why they had their surgery and what they do now, and they just want to feel like you know what you're talking about and you know what you're doing, but they want a simple explanation for, for how they're going to get better. And I think they want oftentimes just a plan to follow because they trust your expertise. So with that said, I really believe in specific assessments to make sure we're capturing all the things we need to do, but I'm not here to, you know, over dork and nerd out and talk about the stats and talk about all the terminology. I just want to help someone understand why they're in pain and what I can do to help them. Okay. I also very much believe the majority of my focus in terms of how I treat people is based around workload management, strength and conditioning, and exercise. I really think that all of those things together are probably about 70% of how I treat people. I have spent a lot of time trying to really understand strength and conditioning and really understand pathology and exercise progression and tissue loading at a basic level. And I think that's where I maybe get some of my most positive results. Of course, you know, manual therapies, modalities, different tricks, uh, technologies like STEM or BFR, are, those will always be useful. But if those things go nowhere, if you don't have a really good foundational way to progress people through exercise. And so that's what a lot of people were asking me about for this, particularly with low back pain, but also in the next few days is the exercise progressions that I've learned from all the people I've studied from, but also that I have found really helpful to, to treat different gymnastics injuries. So once we have good exercise, I really want to make sure somebody has a very slow progressive return to strength and conditioning, plyometrics, um, power, and then also back to gymnastics. And we'll kind of talk about at the end of each day, you'll watch me build a, you know, back pain return to sport program from scratch or, uh, you know, a knee ACL from scratch or something like that. And my hope is that by literally outlining exactly as if you were looking over my shoulder, watching me make a program and hearing me talk out loud about why I do it, that will better, better prepare you to, to work with the gym gymnast when they come in front of you to, you know, uh, feel more comfortable treating them in the very first three days of an ACL tear or having somebody go back at nine, 10, 11 months. So uh, I do use other things, right? Manual therapies, modalities, a little bit here and there. I have some of that inside of the course because I believe in it. I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of, of the debate back and forth, but I find that it helps people to have less uh, discomfort, particularly with acute injuries. It helps them exercise more comfortably and it helps them regain range of motion and get back to their life. Um, and like I said, it is not the main thing I do, but it is definitely part of what I do. What I am not a fan of, okay, being back to the manual therapy thing is I'm not really about saying like, you know, trying to pull the wool over their eyes or kind of sugarcoat things. There's a tactful way to talk with people, which is just being empathetic and kind of being human. But I'm never having somebody come in and be like, oh, if you just come in for this special exercise, this special hamstring manual therapy, you know, your, your leg will magically feel better. You can compete this weekend and all is going to go well. And I'm the, I'm the savior, right? That is just not the reality of how, uh, tissues work. Maybe I'm an idiot and maybe I'm missing out on the magical tricks, but I've studied a lot of stuff and I have yet to find something that somebody comes in with really bad hamstring pain or really bad shoulder pain. And I can like snap my fingers and do a special manual therapy or exercise. And they like instantly feel better and it all goes away. Um, kudos to you. If you have found those hacks, I, I, believe in uh, maybe that coming down the road, but that's personally not my approach. Um, I'm also very clear with people about what they need me for and what they don't need me for. Okay. I've worked in other settings. I'm not going to go into it where it really feels like we're just going through the motions so we can bill people. And um, I'm very fortunate right now that I work in an outpatient cash-based clinic where 
somebody comes to me for 30 minutes, I'm giving you what you need me for for 30 minutes, which is education, assessments, designing programs, hands-on stuff, um, you know, teaching you to exercise, teaching you to do a program. I am all about that. But I am not going to have somebody come in and just keep doing the exact same program they're doing at home that they know how to do just so I can get 30 more minutes, right? Like I've treated some really intense back uh, stress fractures or stuff like one time per week, every two weeks if they're really far away and they're strapped for money. I really don't believe in just billing people and just doing people, you know, having people in the clinic just to have people there. Like sometimes people will come in for a 30 minute session and our environment is very casual and we love having people in to talk and hang out. So they'll be there for like an hour and a half, just kind of like they do the stuff they need with me, but then they're talking out there. They do some stuff out in the gym. They kind of work here. So they're kind of moseying around for the culture and the fun, but I'm not trying to waste someone's time. And I'm very clear about that upfront. And I think that in the business terms, you know, what you don't gain in visits and time on the clock, you regain with word of mouth when you treat people well and you do a good job. So that's how I've personally been able to grow a lot the last 10 years is by being nice and trying to help people and constantly learning and trying to do the best that I can. I get a lot of referrals from other people's teammates and I work with other teams because of that. So I would highly recommend that for people. Okay, I also know that there's still this giant debate between pain science and mechanical models and different systems and social media is an absolute war zone sometimes. I love social media for certain reasons. I run a business that promotes the podcast and stuff, so I get it. But man, that if there's one thing that I got tons of my time and mental energy back from is not arguing in the Twitter comment sections about what RCT said this over a stats method. Like it is exhausting to try to have that. If someone has a conversation they'd like to talk about, I call them, I have them on a podcast, I try to discuss with them and have a nuanced conversation in private about what they think. I really think we're doing social media and a lot of people out there, particularly new grads, a disservice when we're just kind of bickering back and forth about little things or trying to get jabs or shots about research. Like I'm all about peer reviewed literature, but goodness, man, that is exhausting. So I really don't believe in that at all. Um, I also really feel that jumping steps is sometimes uh, done. You know, I think in high level, elite level sports, there's obviously some times when big things are on the lines and you're trying to help somebody control their pain or feel better. But, you know, jumping right to an injection or jumping into having surgery or the other way, which is like only doing PT all the time and never entertaining the conversation, those extremes, I'm really not a fan of. That's why I really harp on interdisciplinary care. And I'm also really not a fan of getting into, you know, never you never use imaging ever because, you know, trust the man, not the scan or whatever. There are times when you really need to understand if someone has an acute fracture or if someone tore their ACL or if somebody has something really bad going on with like a serious pathology. And I'm also not a fan of like throwing surgeons or other medical providers off under the bus. You know, there are times when I think things maybe took a, a little bit of a wrong turn, but I'm not going to tell the person in front of me like, oh my God, I can't believe that person did that. Like, that's just, that's just. Uh, you know, very petty, honestly, and it's, it's not helping the profession at all. So I always frame it as like, hey, you know, that's what you've been through. And you know, you're here now, and I'll take a fresh look at you. And we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so yeah, I just want to kind of clear those things up firstly, because I think it's really important to set the rest of the stage. So on the pain science versus mechanical thing, like I said, I've spent a lot of time reading both. And I can promise you they're more overlapping than different, right? The pain science world will tell about sensitization and nociceptive drive and, you know, all those kind of things about, uh, you know, uh, high sensitization levels causing perceived threat and guarding and neuro tags. I think that stuff's very important. I really do. Um, it's typically the population that isn't a high level gymnast or isn't someone who's in gymnastics and sports because sometimes you do get those factors, those biopsychosocial factors being really important. But at some point, it really is about force and it really is about anatomy and biomechanics, right? So, so that's where I, when I was really young in my career, I spent two or three years treating a lot of chronic pain along with gymnastics. And I learned a lot about those things and I helped a lot of people, I think. But then as I worked up in higher levels of gymnastics or more intense sports, I started to lean into my, uh, my sports um, residency and stuff like that. And I started to realize, wow, I really need to understand anatomy, strength and conditioning, biomechanics, kinematics, like pathology, biomechanics, stuff like that, which is where biomechanics and the pathomechanics below come. People like Stuart McGill, Mike Reinald, Eric Cressy, Lenny, Macrina. Those people are very heavy into the patho, you know, pathophysiology model. And I coming from the chronic model, I was like, oh, I can see all the value in the pain science. And I can see, okay, now I can see all the value in the more heavy pathomechanics model. I very much combine them together and treat people. Sometimes I lean more more into the pain science side when somebody comes in and they're really scared about their back and they're really scared about their imaging and they're really really fearful I'll just kind of lean into more of the pain science tools that I have if somebody comes in they've been studying all the anatomy they want to learn high level force stuff they understand strength and conditioning I'll lean a little bit more into the darky stuff and I'll tell them exactly what they want to hear you got to be adaptable and kind of meet the person where they are
All right. I don't believe in the narratives that are sometimes out there around like you need to buy this thing or this is like the magic exercise, like reset this or like pop this back into place and then you can compete. Um, I think it's oversimplifying things. I think it's really a bit too complex and the evidence has definitely moved away from some of those things, particularly with back pain. You know, that like just just rotate your hips like this with some sort of crack and then, you know, that'll be like, ta da, you're all better. And I'm sorry if I just offended anybody in there, but I spent two years of my life studying that stuff inside and out. And then I started reading the evidence and kind of coming to terms with my own reality about what I was or was not doing in my palpation skills. Um, and I just moved away from it. So hopefully people are not, again, upset by that. But I'm really a big fan of, you know, listening to what people are saying, trying to do the best I can. If it's working, keep going. If it doesn't work within a couple of visits, let's take a step back. Let's pivot. Let's think about something else. Do I need someone else's opinion? Do we need to follow up with someone that I can kind of get a response from? I'm in this constant mode of like, try some things, take a step back, listen, reflect, repeat, try a couple of things, take a step back, see if it works. You know, that constant feedback loop is how I think I've been able to help a lot of people. Okay, so these are the five phases that we'll talk about. Okay, so number one is we're going to start with the acute phase. Okay, it technically for me is phase one and phase two. It's the acute phase and the subacute phase, but it gets really murky here, right? This like concept of putting the fire out as we'll talk about, it's very hard to judge where somebody is on like the very acute stuff and the kind of getting better. I, ju I judge the acute phase, like the complete damage control, the first week of an injury, you know, either it's getting imaging and figure out what's going on or it's managing swelling, managing pain. It's really, really that kind of hot flared up. Oh, that, that really is not a, a fun thing to deal with. Then it goes into the subacute phase a little bit, which takes you into the first section. And then we kind of move into the third phase, which is the intermediate phase for me, which is being a human again, right? So that first six weeks, let's just put the fire out, right? And then we kind of say, okay, can you walk up the stairs? Can you drive? Can you sit in school? Can you carry your backpack? Like not even talking about anything related to sports at all. It's just, can you function in your daily life? That is the second goal. The third goal would be phase four, which would be the advanced or the strength and conditioning phase. So this is when you're generally trying to be an athlete again. So we're not doing gymnastics yet, but we're really trying to say, can we jump? Can we skip? Can we squat? Can we hinge? Can we push? Can we pull? Can we do all the things that a really well-rounded strength and conditioning program would give you? And I think that's a really important step that a lot of people miss because oftentimes the athlete is not in so much pain anymore, but we know the force jump, if they were to go back to gymnastics, is astronomical. And so I see this a lot with back pain, a lot with knee pain, people start to feel better and they test the waters, quote unquote, or they don't have a really good, uh, you know, exposure to strength and conditioning. And because that lack of force progression isn't there, they never really have a great experience getting back to gymnastics. And so that is a really big part of what we'll talk about this weekend is kind of getting somebody from the, the basic ADL phase to the, okay, I'm ready uh, to do gymnastics because I've jumped and I've sprinted and I've done push-ups and some handstand work and I'm really getting the motor going again. And then lastly, which is another thing a lot of people talk to me about, which is a, a very specific objective return to sport program. So what types of variables can we understand from a, a surface point of view or a repetition point of view or a skill difficulty point of view to slowly get somebody back maybe over six weeks and again, not push too hard too fast. So I'm very lucky that Mike and Lenny have taught me a lot about the science of that. I've worked with Tim Gabbard a lot on workloads and I think I found a system that's at least helpful right now combined with the research from like Dr. Emily Sweeney and, and Ellie Hart and other people to try to make my own version of what I think is really useful, combining what they found is good and combining what I know from my experiences. But those are the five major phases that we're gonna talk about all weekend. Today we'll be back. Tomorrow will be lower body. The next day will be upper body. All right. So let's talk about timelines as this is something that a lot of people ask me about. When can the, I progress between these timelines? Let's first just be really uh, clear that there's so much variety here because an ACL tear versus a growth plate irritation versus a quad strain are three completely different injuries, but they all have knee pain, right? So it's very important that you study and you understand the specific tissues involved and what that might be from a timeline healing point of view. But I personally have found that four to six weeks is a really good kind of gauge to start with. So the first uh, and second phase of acute and subacute, obviously I say I combine those together because it's kind of hard to determine. It's a little murky waters in there. But then from there, I generally find most people are in that four to six week range for each phase. So one and two is together, that's four to six weeks. And then we have the uh, the second phase going into the third phase, which be the third phase by itself is four to six weeks, that intermediate phase, the advanced strength conditioning phase, maybe four to six weeks. And then that last phase return to sport, four to six weeks. Obviously, if somebody has a less severe injury, just a muscular strain, they might be better in three weeks. They might be, they might take a week off and never come to PT and be fine. If somebody tears their quad tendon, that's like literally the longest possible, right? That's like a year. 
So I think it's really important that while I give you these timelines, please don't take these as gospel. These aren't pr protocols. These aren't hardcore numbers you have to go by. But in my mind, it's how I explain to people timelines from the beginning. And then I say, hey, based on your injury, based on when you got it, based on your level, your age, your goals, when we're going back to gymnastics, based on what your gym culture is like, based on the equipment you have, like those factors are things that are fluid you work with. But I generally find that this timeline helps people wrap their head around how long is this going to take? If I can tell someone from the beginning, hey, these phases will each probably take about four weeks. So you're looking at about three months before we start gymnastics again. It's kind of hard to hear that, but on the very front end of their injury, they don't have unrealistic expectations down the road. And I think level setting those expectations is massively important. So here's some severity uh, examples, right? So say someone has extension and rotation-based back pain, maybe their facet syndrome, which is a less severe type of this injury, it could be one to two weeks for each phase. Maybe it's four to eight weeks in total. They landed a one and a half kind of odd. They tweaked their back a little bit and <clears throat> excuse me, they tweak their back a little bit and maybe they just have a little bit of soreness. They take a week off, they get back slowly. Okay. Versus somebody with a stress reaction who has a bony issue now. So maybe it's about two to three weeks for each thing because it's starting to get into the, the, the bony pathology. Now, maybe we're looking at eight to 12 weeks total. Somebody has a spondylolisthesis or a spondylolisthesis and they have a full fracture. Well, those take a long time, right? Those You might be braced for three months, then you might have to do all your reconditioning and then you might have to get your return to sport program. You could be looking at like four to six months total to really feel like you're back in, uh, back in the saddle a little bit versus, you know, a very advanced spiny that has slippage, that has nerve damage, like, or nerve irritation. Like, man, that's, that's a completely different ballpark than a facet syndrome. So just in this example of a very common thing we see, which is extension and rotation based back pain, we have very different timelines we might be educating somebody on from the very beginning. All right. So phase one, this, this man, this is not fun to deal with. Like as a medical provider, I often feel very helpless here because yes, I have some things to make you feel better. And yes, I think we're going to do some great things to make you more comfortable, but geez, this is going to take some time. And it's really frustrating because you want to help someone. You're like, Oh, I just want you to be out of pain. But the, the examples I took from some research studies here is on the left, you have this kind of pain science model of, you know, ascending nociception and high neural drive and a lot of fear and avoidance and, and guarding and stuff. Then on the right, you have like the chemical soup, they call it right. The very hot kind of uh, highly, uh, highly, highly um, irritable tissues from uh, a lot of chemical irritation. And we could argue literally for hours about which one of these two things is probably present here. But all I see is someone in front of me who really is not in a comfortable position and is really unfortunately having a tough time. And so I'm very honest with them that, hey, listen, I'll try to help you, but this is going to take time. Okay. And from there though, I, I think that we do this acute phase and it kind of combines with the subacute phase, but a lot of this is going to come down to education, activity modification. It's going to come down to teaching them about what causes their pain, what doesn't cause their pain. Maybe heat helps them a little bit. Maybe medication helps them a little bit. Maybe active mobility helps them. Just getting up and walking around and being active, regular movement. We're going to cover all these things in depth. So I'm kind of going at a high level here. We're going to literally break down step by step in the next lectures, but I just want someone to just be like, listen, we need to find why you're hurting and why you're not hurting. Do some things to get you past this first week maybe. And then we'll start to be of a clear trigger of what makes you worse and what makes you better. And again, we'll go very in deep into the acute phase of low back pain today and then the other things tomorrow. Okay, so subacute phase will now be like, okay, I'm feeling better, but I don't feel awesome still. So like I, I clearly have a, a tissue uh, preference, right? So like I've been forward, it feels okay, but I've been backwards and all oh, that feels terrible. Or like, you know, I, I put weight on my leg and I bend it and like, ah, it doesn't feel so awesome. But if I walk with a little bit of weight, I feel okay. If I move my arm all the way overhead, oh, it doesn't feel awesome. But down here, I'm actually okay. So they start to get this little bit of a range develop because the chemical irritation is calming down. And obviously, depending on what type of injury and the severity, you know, you might be able to do things more aggressively with exercise or not. But in this subacute phase, you're still riding out that four to six weeks of like just feeling really, uh, uh, just really uncomfortable from an acute injury or something that's been flared up a little bit. All right. So like I said, these two go together. Education is really important. I'm trying to teach somebody about what you should do in the first, uh, you know, acute days of injury, no matter what I do in physical therapy, cupping, dry needling, exercise, whatever. It means nothing if the person goes home and doesn't listen to anything that I say. And, you know, their back hurts. And when, when they when they flex forward, they have a, a disc irritation or some sensitivity there. And they go and they sit on the couch for four hours or they go do their homework for four hours. Right. Like I have to really educate them on why their back hurts or why their knee hurts and what we can do to help them around that. And that goes with activity modification and workload modification, even if you're in season, right? Like if you have a growth plate irritation and you have a really gnarly bone irritation, I'm sorry, but impact's not going to feel awesome. And if, if we want to really heal this thing up and not get a stress fracture that keeps you out for four months, we have to respect that. You know, we really, we really have to respect that. And so 
That's a tactful way to develop that skill of talking to people, but a combination of workload modification from education, teaching them about how to modify their ADLs at home. If your back really hurts when you bend backwards, we probably shouldn't sleep on your stomach, right? If your knee really hurts when you go bend your knee in a single leg position, maybe we should go step over step on the stair for a couple of days, right? By educating them on what the pain is, why they have it, what are our thought process behind timelines, we kind of calm them down a little bit. The pain science world says we're maybe doing some neuro tag work. I think it's just being a good human and just helping them kind of feel a little bit more trust with you as a provider. Okay, I do want to try to maintain someone's workload if we possibly can. So when someone's in this acute phase, as we'll talk about with some ACL stuff in a minute here, I really want to try to do as much as we possibly can, because from a mental health and a pain science point of view, I don't want someone to feel like they're broken, right? I don't want someone to feel like, oh my God, I'm injured, I'm hurt, I can't do anything. And it kind of starts, the, the, the walls start to cave in sometimes as an athlete when your identity is lost there. But also we know from Tim Gabbett's research and the AIS is that for every little bit of workload we can maintain, can maintain, we get a little bit more on the back end and returning back. So if we can keep 20%, 30% of their workload, they feel like they're part of the group, they feel like they have a plan, they're gonna try to use the best they can to be an opportunity to work on other stuff, but it's probably gonna help them on the other side get back to gymnastics faster. And a couple examples here are kind of no-brainers, but if your shoulder hurts, you could probably do some core stuff. You could probably do a full leg strength. You just can't use your arm. You know, Just tuck it in your side with a sling or whatever you're doing and just be smart about it. If you have an ACL, you can probably do some biking and put your leg up on a stool and use your arms on an airdyne bike or do some seated arm strength with some rowing and some overhead pressing. We have some people who have like Tommy John surgery or some other stuff. And they're in our gym, like by week four, or week five, doing a lower body program or doing some core work. There's a lot of creative ways that we can do it. If we talk to the surgeon and we're, we're aware of what the limitations are, and we're really productive about what we're doing in a programming point of view, back pain is sometimes tricky, but can we walk? Can we swim? Can we do some neutral core work? Can we work on our thoracic spine and ankle mobility? What can we possibly do around it? Back pain is a little bit trickier, but sometimes you still can do some stuff. You can you want to keep these people active because, it, it, again, it's hard for them just to sit there and wait for it to heal for a month and feel quote-unquote broken. Okay, like I said, exercise, we maintain as much as we can. It's not so much about, you know, getting stronger. It's about just maintaining that activity. Um, I think there are a lot of ways if you understand strength conditioning principles, as we'll talk about tomorrow and the Saturday, you can modify the range of motion. You can modify the sets and the reps. You can modify the types of uh, squatting or, you know, overhead pressing you do based on that to really keep a lot of things going. But this is a wonderful time for blood flow restriction training, which is a fantastic new technology we have. We can, we can load people with metabolic strain and use e-stim to get their legs going or their arms going without kind of restricting, you know, the, the need to put a lot of load on them. So I, I really do like particularly like back pain or like someone who has an acute knee injury or an ankle injury. As soon as we can kind of get them into a safe way to do it, I'll put maybe a lower occlusion pressure and do some just low level training, whether it's a bike or whether it's some squats or body weight stuff or the normal program they would do. We would do that with BFR. And I think that again, it gives them a little bit of a sweat and makes it a little harder. We know there's some good research on maintaining muscle and not having so much of a strength decline or maybe adding a little bit of muscle it's still up in the air as of this recording but that's really important for them right there's a lot of ways we can still keep them active and these are great ways to make them feel like they're getting a lot of work done Okay, I know people roll their eyes with this one, but I'll get right through it. My personal stake, uh, take on manual therapy when I do it is that we're not breaking up scar tissue. We're probably modulating tone. There is a lot of research here. It's all inside the, the references. I didn't want to go through like a giant clinical debate on this, but my personal approach is that I'm modulating tone. I'm increasing some blood flow. I'm helping somebody relieve some pain. Maybe we're getting some uh, competitive stimulus for nociception. Maybe we're doing a little bit of soft tissue relaxation. A lot of things are in there, but I am trying to do it uh, to make someone feel better and move better. And I personally use the most of it with really acute injuries or surgeries when someone can't do it themselves. I consider passive range of motion part of manual therapy. So a little bit of soft tissue on your quad, patellar mobilizations, bending your knee over a table, that is manual therapy to me. Ranging someone's shoulder after surgery or if somebody has a, a really stiff ankle after an uh, like a ankle irritation, whatever I can possibly do to help them move more comfortably and eventually get them to exercise better, that's why I'm doing it, okay? I really just use it as a bridge. I'm not having someone lay on the table for 35, 40 minutes and massage every part of their leg and then say, okay, good luck. Let's let's see how it goes. No, that's not exactly what we're doing. We, we do 15, 15 minutes of manual therapy max sometimes and we're spending the entire time exercising. That's really what we're about. Okay, I'm also a big fan of looking above and below in this acute phase is I really want to see, okay, if someone has their backs an issue, what's going on T-spine, what's going on hips. If somebody has knee pain, can we look at their ankle mobility? Can we look at some of their hip motion? Can we understand what's going on? This is a great opportunity to screen those things out. And hey, you have you know two to four weeks where you're kind of banged up anyways and you're, you're a little sore, you can't do some stuff. Let's try to use this as an opportunity to fix the issues above and below so we can then get back to your program down the road and really have you be successful with exercise. I'm a big fan of that. 
So here's an example. Um, we'll just use this case. This was a gymnast that I work with. She had a, an ACL reconstruction. She had a patellar autograph. She also had a medial meniscus repair and a partial lateral meniscectomy and an MCL repair. This was a doozy, man. This is a monster, unfortunately, really, really bad one. But I wanted to use this one because it's, a, it's an overwhelming or complex case that somebody might be intimidated by. So her range of motion and precautions were she was limited to 30 for two weeks because of some of the meniscus uh, placement of where her tear was. And then up to six weeks, she was allowed to bend more. She had touchdown weight bearing for four weeks in crutches, then she could progress. So all the things I just talked about is what we did here. A lot of education on her brace, how to walk and touch down weight bearing without putting weight on your foot, how to manage her swelling, how to do some elevation, how to use an ACE wrap, how to use a brace to make sure the swelling was getting pressed out, how to unlock and lock her brace safely inside of those range of motion precautions, how to get up and down stairs, like a lot of time talking to her about this stuff at home so she was less stressed out. And then we did some heat, right, for, for uh, about five minutes. We put the heat pack on her knee with a weight above her knee to help her get her extension back early after surgery. This was like the first week after surgery I saw her. We see people really early post-op, like seven days or five days. I've seen someone day one. Um, but uh, patellar mobilizations, a lot of soft tissue work for swelling management, mostly on the hamstring, the calf, and just baby range of motion, zero to 30, just real easy. And I don't think I'm doing any miraculous. I'm just getting some some blood flow moving around, getting her to get her guarding down a little bit. Um, and then we popped some e-stim on her quad, and we did quad sets, uh, straight leg raises, lateral straight leg raises, nothing inside because of the MCL tear, some ankle pumps, some hamstring isometric sets, and we called it a day. Okay, so usually when someone's in a lot of pain like this, you can't go super fast with the exercise. So plan accordingly. And then brought her out in the gym, uh, put her leg up on a stool or a, uh, a box so that she wouldn't be using it. And she put her other leg on her two hands, just very light, just did a bike for five minutes, right? She was super fine. She enjoyed it. She said she was feel like she was getting a lot done. And she felt like it helped a lot with her mental state as well. So that would be an example of maybe an acute phase. Okay, a subacute phase. So say we're now six weeks out. Um, we would do that range of motion all the way up to the 90 degrees, which she had. She's obviously progressing off her crutches here at four weeks. So we're educating her about going from two to one crutches. We're still doing the heat. We're still doing patellar mobilizations. I'm still doing some of that soft tissue work to try to enhance her passive range of motion so that we don't lose extension and we can gain back some of that bending more comfortably. A lot of passive range of motion over the edge of the table. And then now instead, maybe we're doing BFR because the stitches have closed and that we're not going to be worried about some you know um, exudate coming out, but also still stim. But now we're loading up a little bit so straight leg raise with two lateral raise with two we're doing the medial one now but at zero pounds clamshells bridging seated knee extensions in an acl protected range some mini standing hamstring curls some weight shifts and some mini squats all things that were in her protocol she was cleared to do the meniscus was coming off a little bit so we went a little bit later but Generally, she was okay for all that. And then now, instead of putting her leg up on the bike, we have her go just to 90 degrees. So she would rotate forward until her brace locked at 90. And she would go backwards and forward just to get some more activation and kind of muscle pumping through. So that's, you know, six weeks. That's out of the uh, subacute phase. And then intermediate phase, as we move on now, I'm really hammering exercise here. This is really where I want to get somebody to a full two-day strength program for the lower body. These are the main movement categories that we use. So squatting, hinging, split pelvis, single leg, and accessory work is kind of the model of strength and conditioning that we use at Champion that I have learned from. Upper body is about vertical pushing and pulling and horizontal pushing and pulling. And then core, we're talking obviously about neutral bracing and breathing in the beginning, as we'll talk about. But you know, we're trying to stress all parts of the core. So anti-flexion, anti-extension, anti-side bending, anti-rotating, and anti-compression. Those are really the, the main focus of the six weeks from six to 12 for this ACL or for someone's back, for example, is I'm trying to get to that. That's what I want, a nice comprehensive two-day basic entry to strength program. All right. And then from here, with that exercise as the main focus, we have to remember that we don't always have to do just a, a full goblet squat to full range of motion or a full split squat or a full overhead dumbbell press. There's a lot of ways we can do it. For one, we could change the range of motion. We could go to two AirX pads, for example, instead of the ground. We could change going from two legs to one leg, right? Maybe someone doesn't tolerate a deadlift very uh, comfortably on their back, but a single leg weighted hip lift is still a hinge and that's tolerated very, very well. Maybe we can change the tempo and the pause instead of adding more range of motion or more uh, load. Maybe someone doesn't really tolerate more load comfortably with a dumbbell press, but maybe we can do a lighter load with a three second lower floor press and a one second pause at the bottom and a one second concentric push. That still puts time under tension with the tissue from a strength and conditioning point of view, but it's not just a, a poundage jump that maybe the pathology doesn't allow us to do. Okay, the density is a very good way to do this too. Maybe someone just needs to go three alternating sets of an upper body, a lower body, and a core instead of just going like squat, 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 squat. We know that it's really good to rebuild their workload to get their density up, but if we just hammer through a straight exercise set with 30 seconds or a minute rest in between, maybe that doesn't make uh, somebody feel more comfortable. And by rotating through three exercises and doing a tri set, somebody is more comfortably tolerating some of those exercises.
Okay, we can also just change the, the set and the load and the rep situations, right? If you're doing three by eight at a moderate load, maybe someone's advancing and they're not getting strong enough anymore and you wanna do a five by five goblet squat or a front squat with a heavier load. Maybe they're ready to go up. Maybe sometimes you gotta back off and go two by 10, right? Because the, the loading itself is too much. But if we back off and do more reps, we can still get a stimulus a little bit. And I obviously know there's differences between strength and power and hypertrophy that we'll go into, but generally sometimes you're limited by pathology here. Okay, so manual therapy is generally uh, discontinued to a home program for me. I might do a little bit more of end range stretching, right? So prone hamstring or prone knee bending for an ACL, for example, or end range, you know, hip range of motion or trying to really get full hip mobility or ankle mobility back with someone who's got a, a surgery or is acute. But generally, it's a, a dynamic warm up. It's foam rolling. It's stretching. I want someone to be independent and do that every day on their own. So we'll typically build into a home program or their warm up or some sort of soft tissue care program. We're going to try to change anything above and below and put that in our movement pattern. So say someone's knee was the issue and we worked a lot on ankle mobility or some hip stuff. We're going to try to integrate those changes into our squatting program or our step down program. If somebody, you know, really was limited with overhead shoulder mobility when they had back pain and it maybe contributed to their stress fracture, we're going to try to do some, some exercises, whether it's, you know, med ball work or whether it's, you know, overhead mobility drills that use a tight core brace with shoulder being the active motion. This is a really good way to grease and groove some of those new changes that we have. Okay, so here's an example of maybe this 12 week ACL. So it's three months out now. So this is a two day program. And this is uh, something you might see in a, you know, a full comprehensive program of somebody who came to me, this gymnast came to me two times per week. So you can see up here at the top, we have that very quick, you know, heat pack to maintain that full extension and that that full bending, doing some uh, soft tissue work to the quad and hamstring, we might do some passive range of motion for the joint over the edge of the table, and then a prone quad stretch to get that quad stretched out, we're trying to go heel to butt on both sides. So we slowly were working on that. But then on here, you see all those main movement patterns, right? We see squat over here we see hinges over here we see another hinge over here we see a split pelvis or a single leg over here so we're seeing these main movement patterns that we'll go into as we get farther in the weekend of squatting hinging squ uh, you know single leg push pulling and split pelvis but these things are all built in here so i have the actual strength conditioning major movements, then we have some core work built in because we know that's important for lower body stuff. So some uh, suitcase carry taps, we have some uh, different side planks, we have some uh, cone tapping for balance and dynamic stability. Then down here at the end, we finish with maybe an isolated burnout, kind of like straight leg raise of little circuit here, but you can see there's more weight here, right? So front, inside, outside, we're doing this, the, the BFR, the knee extensions, the hamstring curls, the goblet squats. We're trying to just kind of stress out the end a little bit. And then now they're getting on the bike, but instead of just coasting along from 90 degrees, as you saw, in six weeks, we're actually trying to maintain some wattage to make it moderately difficult, you know, something you could hold a conversation at, but nothing too crazy. But we're just not going through range of motion now. We're actually trying to get the heart rate up for 10 minutes and kind of get some of that workload back. So that's an example of moving into the intermediate phase. All right, advanced phase. Goodness gracious, man, this is a time we're working hard. And I think this is a time sometimes, unfortunately, where medical providers maybe without a strength conditioning background, if you don't know what normal versus abnormal responses are to exercise, it's very tough sometimes to know if the program is hard enough or not hard. So normal is you should be sore, right? Your quad should be sore. Your hamstring should be sore. You should be sweating, man. You should be getting after it. You should be really, really working hard if you're in the you know four or five month phase and you're trying to get back from a big injury. It's not normal to have someone with very specific joint pain uh, irritation. If the swelling goes up in a knee or in an elbow, if the range of motion starts to go down because the capsule is getting irritated or the, the knee itself is getting sore, you don't want someone to have that very specific loss and impairment level. So normal is hamstring soreness, quad soreness, you know, but not normal is I can't bend my knee. It feels puffy. It's hard to walk. It hurts going downstairs. The swelling objective measurements on a joint line are bigger. That's an abnormal response. And I've had plenty of times where I thought a dosage of exercise was okay. They had no pain during it, but they text me the next day or two days later, they come in like, ah, it just doesn't feel awesome. And you say, okay, well, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, you know, we tried to do the best we could, but it's kind of like making soup as my buddy Dan Pope says, you know, you toss in some ingredients and you taste it, you toss some ingredients in and you taste it. So we just overdosed a little bit and we're going to try to just back off for a session or two, and then we'll, we'll modify the program next week and we'll get back to it. You know, it's not always perfect, but I think it's important for us to make sure we're pushing someone and preparing them for the gymnastics demands that are coming down the road. And then exercise, like I said, the next progression for me is all about power, plyometrics, capacity work. So lower body is going to be vertical and horizontal power. So uh, jumping and landing mechanics, broad jumps, sprinting progressions, which we'll cover in depth. Um, upper body is going to be about, again, vertical and horizontal power. So can we do some med ball work? Can we do some push-up plyometric progressions? The spine is really going to need to tolerate really fast moving of flexion and extension forces and compression forces to get back to gymnastics. So we're trying to dose those things in a controlled fashion here during the advanced and strength conditioning phase. 
We're also trying to rebuild their uh, overall capacity and their workload level, right? So as we talked about, we might have someone 16 weeks of an ACL that can do more on the bike. They can do some ropes. They can do some planking. You can build this into your sessions or maybe just teach them how to do these exercises and have them doing on an off day. But the more we can build out their chronic workload from just learning how to work hard for a long time, that is what they're going to need to go back to practice. That is what they're going to need to go back to full level of training. So along with what we're doing in the gym for the actual injury, we should be building our plans to really accommodate you know, a lot of workload getting done across the week to kind of slowly build them up. Aerobic fitness is definitely a modulator of injury risk, as we see in some of the research. So if we can help someone get fit around their injury, that's very, very important. And here's an example here, right? Exercise is pretty much all we're doing here, bread and butter. So we see a little bit of bike in the warm up now instead of heat. We see a little bit of quick, soft tissue work, or maybe just a little bit of passive range of motion if they need it. Not always. Some people really just skip this all together and do a dynamic warm up. But then also we see here some plyometrics, some pogo hops, some skipping, karaoke, um, some light acceleration jogs. On the second day, we would see some uh, uh, two up, one back drills, which are just cone drills. Uh, but we're just trying to get someone to move a little bit faster. You see a power section. We'll talk about some of these exercises over today and tomorrow and the next day but some hurdle hops for an ACL, some sideways jump and stick and land, some double leg broad jumps, um, some single leg rebounders that are harder with a step down, connected vertical squat jumps, some different pogo hops. These are just advancing plyometrics and uh, you guys can just take these out and check out the entire thing obviously after. I want to include a full program so it was really a lot of exercise value, but heavier trap bar deadlifting now instead of kettlebell deadlifting, we're doing landmine squats, heavier suitcase carry marches, skater squats, split squats, really hard exercise, right? This is hard. If you were to do this as a sports performance program, you'd be gassed, man, in a good way. But this is how we rebuild that top level of capacity. We typically test somebody on their strength for like a shoulder or a knee or an ankle. We test them on a dynamometer, as we'll talk about, around four to five months if they have a big injury or earlier. If not, if they're just coming from an acute cuff strain, we can test that on the first day. But we know objectively what muscles need to be trained and what things are really important. So that's why this program starts to get really hard specifically. Then at the end, we're going to go to failure on BFR, right? So maybe now we're really gassing somebody out on a heavier weight because they've kind of earned the right to do something really, really hard by five months out now. So uh, this is an example of a two-day program for that. That same gymnast that was towards the tail end of her, not the tail end, but the, the end of her rehab, which was five and six months. So we do these programs for four to six weeks. And then uh, last thing here is just some active flexibility and mobility work for gymnastics. The upper body, lower body spine has to go through some pretty insane ranges of motion for gymnastics. So you're trying to work in maybe a home program to get some of their active kicks back for their hips or their knees, um, sh stomach, stomach shoulder circles, some reverse plane drops, things that really require body weight loaded mobility, um, tall kneeling back bends and flexing. We want to regain the mobility that we had prior um, to get back safely to gymnastics. We also want to start getting back to gymnastics specific conditioning so we can have someone maybe starting to dabble in the gym for for, you know, an hour, a couple days per week to do their basic conditioning. Upper body will look like rope climbs, uh, bar strength, handstand progressions if they're cleared for it. Lower body will look at things with like the calf, high releve toe pointing, a lot of body tension work, good form work, good shaping work. Uh, the core itself will take hollows and arches and core bits and all that kind of stuff. And again, we'll chat about this, but I'm just kind of talking at a high level right now. Workload management will be the first and most important start of the return to sport process. My classic cliche line is, hey, I want to get you back on the gym mat as fast as possible. I want you back in competition as fast as possible, but as safely as possible. I'm not going to let you go back to bars and your chain if it means we're going to risk a giant injury. So we usually try to use the acute to chronic workload ratio, which I know has some controversy around the stats right now, but it's still generally a good idea to slowly add load to somebody. So well, the acute load is referred to as what they're doing in one week typically. Sometimes it's a little bit longer, but the chronic load is what they're doing in the previous two to three weeks. So it's really good just to have an idea of like, okay, how hard is one week versus what did we do the last? couple of weeks so we don't really jump up your training load and when we build return to sport programs from scratch you'll see this kind of in the flesh is we're not going to go from three reps of an exercise to 25 reps of an exercise the next week because that would be a little bit too aggressive on their body but you can use different tools to do this. Uh, that if you're not familiar with this research at all, the session RPE is a really good kind of back of the envelope way. So take your time and, and minutes and, and multiply it by what the athlete's RPE is, that rate of perceived exertion, zero or one being that was the easy, super, super easy, nothing problematic. 10 is like, deal, I was dying. That was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. So if you multiply those numbers together, 60 minutes of rehab times the seven, you might get 420 units. And then maybe you combine that with a 90 minute strength session later in the week, five RPE, that's 450. You can start adding these units together and understand week to week, how hard are we doing it? And it starts to get helpful when you have gymnastics practice and rehab and maybe a home strength session, they can start logging and adding these numbers together. And we can understand how someone's global RPE is along with counting reps, along with counting surface progressions, as we'll talk about in depth today. Okay, the overall uh, surface, uh, sorry, the overall variables that I'm using in return to sport programs, regardless of any injury, whether it's lower back, lower extremity, upper extremity, I'm personally going to use the differences of this, the surface, 
the force per skill and the total repetitions. Those are really the three main variables that I use in the sport uh, programs that I design. So the surface is going to be something soft like a trampoline or a tumble track or a foam pit, then progressing maybe over a couple of weeks to a rod strip or a semi-firm kind of landing situation, and then progressing finally to a spring floor. And then the force per skill, right, would be that the easier skills, so handstands and basic shaping and basic drills, we would progress from those for two weeks to maybe some more advanced things like maybe some roundup back handspring layouts or maybe some just uh, connected layout series or things like that. Then finally, we know the most advanced skills are the highest force. So can we start from maybe a level progression of like, you know, lower competitive levels they used to do when they were like five years old from like level four skills to eight skills to 10 skills? Um, or is it maybe just about whatever skills they're getting back to and understanding, okay, a, a handstand is, is less force than a round off, which is less force than a back handspring, which is less force than a roundup back handspring, which is less force than a roundup back handspring double back. If you understand and study from coaches and other people, you can see those force progressions. And I will also share with you some of the things that I have found very, very helpful. And then repetitions is kind of the most obvious one, which is three is less than five, which is less than seven. So you might want to progress the volume week to week to make sure you're building up some of that together. I will caution you here though, as we talk about is you don't want to increase all three variables at the same time. So we don't want to make someone go from a, a, a softer surface to a harder surface, doing more harder skills and doing more of those hard skills in the same day. That could maybe be too much. So we're very careful about which variables we manipulate on week to week. All right. And then I'm typically going to have someone do, uh, give me your skills, give me your level, give me your goals and what we're doing in season. We're going to progress these things every two weeks. And we're going to start with a three day per week program with 24 hours in between. The reason I do that is because I want to monitor symptoms in between. If somebody's doing their program, they oftentimes have adrenaline. They're excited to go back. They don't really know how sore they're going to be or how tired they're going to be until you get back uh, in depth into the program itself. And maybe the next day you wake up and you're like, Ooh, my back's a little bit more sore than I thought. We want that 24 hours in between to make sure we monitor for symptoms. And it doesn't always you know, happen. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but you just want to have that buffer a little bit. And I'm always building in uh, home programs and strength conditioning programs that we'll talk about in the next slide, uh, the next two slides as kind of like into the the repetitions of the programming itself. So one event, say a, a male gymnast, I would have them if they're doing three events per day, one of those events, I would build in their home program, it builds up their strength and makes them still do their home program, but it also takes away from the total repetitions. So it's a little bit of a way to double manage those things and have them be in the gym, be excited and doing things, but not just going crazy on too many repetitions. Okay, and then some things that I think some people struggle with sometimes is, you know, getting back to sport, I get a lot of Emails from people saying, you know, I'm making this program, but the gym's not listening, or maybe the parents are not understanting, or they're rushing back. And uh, I've, I've started to just kind of be more blunt about these things. Like, listen, if the culture in the gym you're trying to get somebody back to, they won't listen, they won't communicate, they're not willing to change, they're not willing to follow a program, it's not going to work out. So I tell those uh, athletes to follow their own plan and, and stand up for themselves and have the parents step in and talk to that. And if the person doesn't listen, I'm sorry, you got to find a new gym. Um, it's just not going to work out. Your back's not going to get better if you go back and you have to do 45 back handsprings or you have to go back and do ring strength every single day and there's nobody listening to how your shoulders feel. It's just a, a reality of the sport. Some places, uh, unfortunately, are still like that. The vast majority of places are amazing. So I just want to say that from the start that culture is tough and sometimes it doesn't go well, but the most most people want to work with you. Most people love the plan. They want to hear from you. They want to work together. They want what's best for the kids, but there are just straight up places that just don't listen and I tell them to leave. Uh, skill modifications are another big part. That's really important too as well. If someone is having a lot of back pain with a series or if a male gymnast is having a lot of pain in their shoulders with like jams, for example, and they're optionals and they can do it, if you can modify that skill or a few skills, like say round off layouts or round off fulls instead of round off back handspring, it makes a massive difference on the workloads. And I think it really goes a long way for their their return to sport and getting back to uh, you know long, healthy careers. So having that conversation earlier that like, hey, we're going to try to get back to these things, but we might have to modify some things. So start talking with your coach or start looking at the code or trying to understand where we can change things a little bit. That's really important as well. And then always external pressures uh, are very, very important, right? The parent, the coach, the teammate all has to have the same goal. Everybody sometimes, unfortunately, is putting pressure on the athlete to, to come back and they want them to be competing, of course. But if the gymnast goal has changed or if it's not the same as what the parents and the coaches think it is and they try to go back with, I don't want to do optional gymnastics anymore. I don't want to do gymnastics anymore, period. I want to play volleyball and, and uh, you know lacrosse. We have to respect that. We have to understand that. But that conversation has to happen earlier or else it's going to be very, very awkward when you try to get back. 
And then lastly, here's just a return to sport strength program that would go along with what we'll talk about in the, uh, you know, the, the custom return to sport module building, but these are the home programs, just the maintenance care, all the stuff, the high level plyometrics, the high level speed. Um, this is the ACL that I talked about. She was nine months out. And so she was returning back to gymnastics and then two days per week, she was doing this home program, a really hard strength program. That's what she was doing. A very challenging strength and conditioning program for sports performance. And this was, I think a big reason of why she was able to get back safely because doing this program twice per week inside of the gym pulled her away from so many impacts but it also really allowed her to get the high level strength conditioning that she really needed and she then she followed the the return to sport program that we'll cover uh tomorrow is the lower body day um but a very specific plan with what to do how many to do was really the key to her success so uh that about does it for this one i think that was a good like i said overview and uh we got the dorky stuff out of the way kind of the abstract thinking out of the way and now we'll dive directly into the assessments and the fun stuff the tests and kind of breaking down how to help somebody the most and then we'll go through all the phases for low back today and the rest of the weekend so hope that was helpful <laughs>